Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another week on uh, late June. Very happy that you're all here. Um, today, we're going to move, as you can see in the title, to deep learning. But of course, we start with feedback, um, which was relatively decent last time. You um, roughly seem to, seem to like the lecture. And I should say that the evaluation of this course is also in, but I don't want to discuss it today because it just doesn't fit quite from the time. I will either do that on Thursday or next Tuesday. I'll put aside a few minutes to talk about the evaluation. Um, here are detailed feedback. So um, uh, two of you wrote that it's still too fast. There's still too much math. And we're flipping back and forth too much between different layers of communication. Um, I will try to change that a bit today. Let's see whether it works out. Um, some people also seem to like me jumping around. So someone, I'm not sure this is actually a, like, meant earnestly or ironically. I don't know. But thanks a lot for pointing out that I wave my hands around a lot. If it actually helps someone, that's good. So um, someone asked, and this is a very good question, if we're constructing uncertainty in this really weird way by first making modeling assumptions that are wrong, and then finding out what we need to compute, but we realize we can't actually compute it and we need to approximate it, what is the uncertainty actually worth in the end? And my answer to this is, it's worth about as much as the point estimate. But it's a completely like, additional second thing that you get on top. So there are sort of two extremes that both don't work, that are both not good, that I want you to lie between. One of them is this naive thing that, ah, Bayesian reasoning is perfect, and therefore all the uncertainty that falls out of Bayes' theorem is this perfect quantification of what might be wrong about the world. Exact uncertainty. And that's only true in the mathematical sense. If you know the generative model, if you know that the data is actually drawn from some joint distribution with some latent variable, and you actually observe that data. And that's pretty much never true in, in the wild. So it's just a, a sort of an, an ideal we can, we can aspire to, but which we'll never actually get. So if you perfectly believe in your uncertainty, you're typically wrong. But there's the other extreme, which is actually much closer to what mo most of like, ML practice at the moment is, which is there is just this point estimate, take it or leave it. Right? I've, I've made this point estimate. If it's wrong, it's not my problem. And that's also dangerous. Because it's, it's, in a way, it's easier for the person who makes the prediction, because you don't have to then you know, rationalize why your prediction is wrong. When it doesn't work, you can just say, ah, this whole machine learning thing, it's a bit weird, doesn't quite work all the time. But of course, that's unsatisfying as well. So what this kind of uncertainty that we construct in this course gives you is an additional sense for the sensitivity of your model to the data, which parts of the model have been affected by which data and which have not, and uh, how much might therefore change if you see future data. And these are all useful functionality to have, I would say. But so, so you should make use of them. And you should think about how much they cost to construct. But you also shouldn't go around telling everyone that that's the perfect error bar that will always be correct. For me, I sometimes make the distinction between Bayesian reasoning and probabilistic reasoning, which is a bit imperfect because these words tend to be used interchangeably. But for me, Bayesian is this philosophical thing that you, know, you learn from data and then you're uncertain in a, within the sense of an error bar. And then there's probabilistic reasoning, which just takes care to measure things correctly, and then just expresses those measures that fall out of the computation. And then you can analyze those measures and think about whether you trust them or not. The other question was, what are these objects with these indices? And so it's actually good that this question only comes up now in lecture 16, um, because in previous instances of this course, they came up much earlier, because clearly my notation was even more confusing. So I've started using these bullets. And I know that they were confusing for some of you, but maybe they helped a bit because it sort of avoided this problem. So very, very simply, what I'm doing with this notation is that I say there's a function. And usually, we write functions with brackets. That's the typical notation. But we, like computationally, when we do, in particular, Gaussian process inference, we effectively treat them like vectors. Right? We think of an infinitely long list of function values that you can index into. 
That's actually what we do in the functional style programming for Gaussian processes, right? We provide these functions called mean function and covariance function, and then we instantiate them by calling them on an evaluation grid, literally an array with slicing into it. And so I use this shorthand notation to just write it below. That's maybe the first source of confusion. And then the second one is that in these problems, we tend to have training data, which is a vector of training data. And I call that capital X. And I know capital X is dangerous. And then there is little x, which are just points where we evaluate. And then sometimes there's also xi, which is one of these, one particular one. And because this is confusing, lowercase, uppercase, I've started using this thing as just we're evaluating at some point, which we don't know yet where. So to express that that's a function of something which we're not evaluating in some kind of functional programming style way, sort of currying style. There's just this other bit that we haven't evaluated yet, and we'll just leave it flying around. I know that this is confusing, but pretty much all the other notations that I've tried or that I know also aren't good. So we could use A and B. But then what's the connection between A and X? Um, we, could, we could use X star as the test point, but star sounds like optimal, something optimized. And we will today have lots of stars with things that have been optimized. So that's confusing with this. So you know, I flip back and forth between the, the notations. So what have we done now that we are sort of turning towards a new step in the course? What have we actually done so far? So here's a quick overview of the flow of the course on just one slide. So obviously, it's very condensed. We started out, first three lectures, me arguing, you observing, that probabilistic inference is the correct language for reasoning under uncertainty. It's the right way to distribute truth instead of, in the Aristotelian sense, binary values, something is true or false. Instead, distributing it over several possible hypotheses, each of which is a little bit true, because we don't know yet which of them is the right answer. And we realize that the main thing to, to do when we do this is not just well, it's to use measures, but also to make sure that those measures sum to one. There's a finite amount of truth. That's what makes it work. It's also what makes it hard, because now we have to keep track of all the possible hypotheses of how they interact with each other. And if you do it in an abstract form, then there's no concrete realization for it because it's potentially exponentially hard in the number of variables that we keep, uh, keep track of and linearly hard in the number of values that each of these variables could take. So for binary uh, variables, the, the complexity of Bayesian inference or probabilistic inference is 2 to the number of variables. But if the variable can take k possible values, then it's k to the d. And that's really bad if you have continuous variables, because then k goes to infinity, and then this is intractable. It's even more intractable than exponential. It's just not computable. So instead, we use parametric formalizations. We, con we construct particular families of probability distributions over which the inference is tractable. And we found that one really useful framework for this are exponential families. So these are probability distributions where the log probability density function is a linear function of some parameters. And we saw that these, in some sense, simplify inference because they map inference under particular likelihoods to this notion of conjugate inference where we sum up sufficient statistics of the observations. This becomes particularly interesting for one of these exponential families, which is the Gaussian one, the one where the su sufficient statistics are polynomials, the first two moments of the data set, because then inference turns into linear algebra. And that's very good, because computers are good with linear algebra. And so the last, so this was exponential families, was lectures four and five, half of six. And since then, all the way to now, we've basically exclusively used Gaussian probability distributions for all our inference needs. And that might sound like a big chunk of this course, but also linear algebra is a big chunk of what computers do, so that's kind of useful. In fact, we saw that we can do really powerful stuff with this framework. In particular, we can learn functions that map from an input domain x to the real line through a little trick that um, is called linear regression, of course, and you've seen it before, which is that we 
invent a function phi, a representation, that takes in the input x, takes care of it, it surrounds it, it masks it, and computes a bunch of feature vectors, or feature numbers, actually, features, values of features, which are real numbers. So it maps from the input domain to a real vector space. And then we describe the function as a sum of these features with some parameters, some weights, w. And uh, so this notation is just a clean, nice, modern linear algebra way of writing a sum between the feature vectors and the weights. Um, and then we saw that this is quite a powerful language. We can learn nonlinear functions with this, because while this is a linear function in W, it's a nonlinear function in X. So we can learn functions that map in various complicated ways, including on really complicated input spaces, like multivariate input spaces, like structured input spaces. And we can even learn structured outputs, which we'll get to in a moment. So this is a really powerful language for uh, functions. And then we made an interesting observation, which is that when we do Gaussian inference on these type of functions, we actually never encounter a lonely feature vector lying around. Instead, the only thing we really have to compute that actually matters is this inner product between two feature functions weighted by some covariance matrix, sigma. And that led us to this interesting observation that maybe we can get away without these features and by instead replacing this sum with an implicit sum. For example, um, sort of some, some other way of efficiently evaluating this object without this sort of detour to computing the features. In particular, it's even possible to do this with infinitely many features because there are some series. Uh, this is basically a series expansion, right? So it's a, it's a sum over phi i, sigma i, j, phi j over i and j. And if sigma is a diagonal matrix, it's just a sum over phi i, phi i with different inputs. Um, sometimes it's possible to do these series in, an, in a closed form expression, even if they have infinitely many entries, and that's called a kernel, um, or that's a special case of a kernel. This whole object is always called a, called a kernel. And so we realized that we can learn quite ex expressive function spaces, or functions in expressive spaces, with this framework called Gaussian process regression. It also has a neat connection to concepts in computer science, like uh, functional programming, um, which we exploited in the code. And now in the last two lectures, we uh, realized that not all regression problems are of this type. So this is here already quite general in terms of x. x could be pretty much anything. But the output has to be r, a real line. And now uh, last two lectures, we sort of said, well, what if the outputs are, for example, discrete, binary, or uh, integer valued? So if we do classification, well, then we can sort of squeeze the framework a little bit and still make it work. By changing the likelihood, then we are not quite doing conjugate prior inference anymore. So Gaussian prior times non-Gaussian likelihood is not in general a Gaussian posterior. But we saw that we can approximate it with various neat linear algebra approximations, like the Laplace approximation, which is, by the way, just one example, but it's the most straightforward one of this approximate inference paradigm. So that's a big chunk of a classic um, machine learning course in probabilistic reasoning. And if this course would have taken place a few years ago, actually it did take place a few years ago, then at this point we would now usually move on to various other cool things that probabilists have come up with over the years. Like what about unsupervised machine learning and what about some other structured types of inference? Can we build models for those? And maybe we'll get to that in a more compact form at the end of this class. But I really need to address at this point the elephant in the room, which is that a large part of machine learning now isn't actually phrased in this way at all. But instead, if you at least sort of follow social media, you, you, get, you could get the impression that, I don't know, 80 or 90% of machine learning is these days is deep learning. So because you're younger than me, I should point out that that has not always been the case. So historically, the field has evolved maybe at least along two different viewpoints, maybe three. So when I did my PhD a while ago, there were people who worked with kernels, and they called themselves statistical learning theorists, and they wrote lots of math, and they did all this stuff that we've done here before. They talked about reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces and convergence rates and learning rates and so on. Then there were the Bayesians, 
who are largely sort of associated with physics and they build these structured probabilistic models where they observe that things can be multiplied with each other and you can still do tractable stuff. And then there were the so-called connectionists. Um, they had an email list that I was on for a while as well, uh, who, who built these deep learning tools. Actually, they weren't called deep learning then. That wasn't the word. It was just called neural networks or connectionist models or learned representations, or depending on who you talk to. Um, and they, everyone else was sort of looking at them with a little bit with disdain. That's not, in, it's a bit of a trope as well, but it's also not entirely untrue because these models tended to be really bad, difficult to use. So when I tried training a network at some point myself during my PhD, it just did not work. I had no idea how I could ever get this to work. In fact, I had to actually send an email to the original author, UIT in this case, who happened to be in the same town as me while I was doing this, and then walk over and visit him and have him sit down with me for two hours to tell me why this network didn't train. And then he told me all the bugs that I had introduced that, of course, no one had ever told me about were a problem because they were not in the literature. So there was this trope that there were literally only two groups in the world that could train a deep net, Jeff Hintons and Jan LeCunz. And, and maybe this is to some weird degree still true. So some people told me in the feedback that you didn't yet have a deep learning class. E OK, other way around. Who dares? No, raise your hand if you've had the deep learning class. Ah, that's pretty much everyone. OK, so for those five of you who didn't raise your hand, we'll do today a 15-minute introduction, maybe 20 minutes, of what actually deep learning is. And for everyone else, let's see if it matches what Professor Geiger told you in his class. So what is a deep neural network? So. If you, I'm sure you have lots and lots of different pictures in your head now of perceptrons and confnets and resnets and uh, LSTMs and transformers and all of this other stuff. For the purposes of this course, for what I'm trying to get to conceptually, we'll keep it very, very general. I will say a deep neural network is a function that maps from an input to an output where the input is something arbitrary and the output is a multivariate real vector. And that function has the property that it has two um, inputs, but input is a dangerous word. So it takes in two sets of variables. So if you think of it as a program, it has open brackets, two things going in. One of them is the input x, it's the thing that it maps, that it takes in and then maps onto like that maps does something with maps. And the other thing are um, variables that I will call parameters specifically, which change the behavior of this function. And that's actually it. So if you just write it like this, there's not really a need to call it a deep neural network. It's just a function. And maybe that's important sometimes to point out that this is what these things are. It's really just a language to write parameterized functions. Now, the typical setup that makes it deep is that usually these functions are written as some kind of hierarchical recursive construction in one form or another. So you tend to think of some function that takes the inputs, so here is the original input, and then successively applies a, a combination of a linear transformation through the parameters, and then a nonlinear transformation through something that's in some sense, hard-coded. So this, I will call this sigma for some non-linearity, common notation. And of course, it's kind of uh, reminiscent of a sigmoid, but of course, it doesn't have to be a sigmoid. It can be any other non-linearity. And then we apply another, non -li another linear transformation and another non-linear transformation, and so on and so on, all the way to the top. And then capital L is the number of layers of this network. And at the top, again, we apply actually not just a linear, but an affine transformation. So we multiply with a matrix, and then we add a bunch of ones um, times constant. So this is often conceptually separated into weights and biases. So the Ws are the weights, and the Bs are the biases. You saw in my regression um, lecture that this is a bit of a it, I'm, I'm, not, I'm actually not sure myself how useful this distinction is because conceptually we could just say, well, let's just add one more feature to the output, right? The, the, this nonlinearity could also just produce one set of vectors that is unit 
and then we could get the biases into the weights. So it's not a super big deal, but it can be numerically sometimes convenient to separate them from each other because they tend to have different scales. OK, this is it. That's what a deep neural network is. And ever since this sort of structure kind of emerged, people have been super excited about it. And we will talk today a little bit about why. Um, but first, let me show you some code that we're going to use also, to, also in the next lecture to really make this quite concrete. And what I've done is I've taken the, um, the standard tutorial for deep learning in JAX and adapted it a little bit so that it fits better to what we are trying to do. So here's some code that you can also find on, uh, on Elias. It's the usual crap at the start where I just load a bunch of stuff. And the important thing is that we're going to use JAX um, to do this, and we're also going to load an optimizer. Everything else is sort of as before. So the first thing we actually need is we need to define what a network is. So this is it. A neural network is this recursive application of uh, linear transformations or affine transformations to an input. So we take in an input, we call this the activations, and then recursively compute activation times weights plus biases and then nonlinearity. And here I've, con I've chosen a particular nonlinearity, we do. And this, by the way, is this sort of typical thing, right? You get to change the weights, you don't really get to change the nonlinearity. Of course, that somehow basically affects the nonlinearity as well because you're changing its inputs, but yeah, there's this distinction. Um, and that's it, actually. That's the deep neural network. Done. Now, of course, there are lots and lots of other ones, um, but this is my neural network, and I like it, and I'm going to use it. All right? Um, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe on Thursday I'll even show you some more, more advanced code. I think it's sometimes actually useful if you have the chance to look at some sort of production quality modern deep neural architectures, because we tend to think of them as these super arcane complicated things, but they tend to be just a few lines of Python. So um, if any one of you has looked at the Llama code, for example, which is maybe a, an example of a modern large deep learning architecture that is publicly visible and not hidden behind some corporate walls, you'll find that it's just 300 lines of Python. It's not super complicated. OK, and then um, when we have this, we can do something with this network called predict that I, haven't, that I won't talk about now, but in a moment, um, which just takes the outputs and transforms them into classification labels because we need them uh, to be uh, probabilities. And then we can make a prediction. Well, actually, we can't yet because I haven't told you yet what the parameters are. We need to instantiate the parameters first to call, be able to call this function. So this is done by an initializer in the deep learning lingo, typically, which looks like this. So we, uh, this is a function that takes in the architecture. So this, in this case, is just a sim simple list of how wide each of the layers is. And then, or in this case, a, a JAX random key, because we want to keep things deterministic, um, and a parameter, a simple one in this case, and then just goes through all of the layers, and in each layer, produces a weight and a bias, and um, that's it, returns it. So now we can tell this function what kind of architecture we want. By the way, I need to actually run this code so it doesn't like, do anything. OK. Um, and for that, we need to set some, some, some parameters. These are global parameters, so I set them in capitals. We're going to do a binary classification on a two-dimensional input space. So the input space is an image that looks like two-dimensional. Uh, there are dots in there. And then we map onto the first layer, which is 128 units, and then on the second layer, which is 64 units, and then on the output, because I do binary classification, it's a univariate output. Now we have to set these parameters, and now here come some magic numbers that we just have to believe, because I played around with them. Somehow they are right. And then we can make those um, parameters. So this is now a list that contains one, two, three sets of weights and biases. And I can push this into this predict function to make a prediction. This is here. 
and do that. And now after initialization, we saw that then we see that the network can make a prediction. So what I'm plotting in red and green is a data set. It's the one that I've used in the previous lectures as well, with now with a test set in, my, in sort of thin plots. And in the background, this is the initial state of the network before training. So it produces a prediction, which of course is wrong because it hasn't learned yet anything. But you can see that it has some interesting structure. It sort of lies around it as reds and red and green parts. So this is a deep neural network. Does this fit with what you've seen in your deep, deep learning class so far? This is good. OK. Now, um, uh -huh. now we need to talk about how these things actually learn. How do you train a deep neural network? How do you learn a representation to use Jan de Kuhn language? Well, you, you train it by minimizing some loss function. And that's, in a mathematical language, often called empirical risk minimization, where the empirical means that there is an actual data set in here that involves summing over a bunch of data, not some integral over a probability distribution. The risk means that there is a function here that gets minimized. Like risk is always something you want to minimize as opposed to reward, which you want to maximize. And then sometimes there is a regularizer, which is then it's called regularized empirical risk minimization, and people make a big spiel out of it being regularized. So um, what this means is we're going to find a set of parameters, a set of weights and biases, such that this function is minimized. And this function has the property that it's a sum over many individual terms, where each term in the sum depends on one datum, so one pair of inputs and outputs, and the entire set of parameters, weights and biases, through this function that I've called the deep net. And then there's an extra term, the regularizer, which does not depend on the data. And that regularizer could be there, or it could not be there. It could be zero and constant, or it could be something else, something that depends on theta. So I'm just putting it in for full generality. I'm not saying you have to have a regularizer, otherwise it's not deep learning, or otherwise what we're going to do doesn't work. It's just for generality. There might be a function that doesn't depend on the parameters. So what are the typical choices people use for this little l? I haven't, this little l has so far not shown up in my code. So we're going to have to plug it in. So typical choices for classification, and this is where you probably not, it's like I've seen it many times before, are uh, the logistic loss or its um, multivariate version of it, the cross entropy, or sometimes these people kind of, these, these words kind of overlap. There is a binary cross entropy, and there's also a multivariate logistic, which is sometimes called the log softmax, and they're all the same thing. So, they are all these functions, which just happen to look like this, and well, whatever, right? So for um, that, maybe the one main thing to notice about this is that if you use this, so first of all, these functions are functions of two inputs. We tend to think of them as the correct label in the data and the predicted label. But the predicted label is just, it, it's just a function of the weights and biases, right? So it's the output of the neural network, transformed through some nonlinearity, maybe. Um, so this is interesting. There are two things. This is a function of two things going in. And for example, if you think of the binary logistic loss, then it looks like this, which we can recognize as uh, the logarithm of a Bernoulli distribution for the label. So this is like the logarithm of the probability for y being equal to 1 raised to an indicator whether y is 1 times 1 minus that probability raised to an indicator for if y is not 1. Should I write this down? No? OK, it's good. So this is a log probability distribution. And the same holds for the cross entropy. It's the log of a multinomial probability distribution. So a discrete distribution over multiple possible outputs. And then for regression, the other common type of loss is the square loss, 
which is, well, one half, time, one half times the square distance between prediction and, and uh, observation, which we can also think of as a log probability distribution, our famous Gaussian one that we've used so far. Right? Why? Because Gaussian distributions are exponentials of a square, so their logarithm is just a square. In particular, it's a Gaussian distribution with standard deviation one, if you use this loss. Yes? Should this be log negative of log softmax? Probably, yeah. So my main point on this slide is the loss functions people use are logarithms of probability distributions. And that's going to be the connection, of course, we'll make use of. What are the regularizers people use? Priors. Yeah, they're priors, but what are, the actually, what are the actual choices? Like, what do people use? Have you ever used a regularizer in deep, deep training? Yeah? An L2 norm, yes. So the most widely used regularizer is the L2 norm, sometimes called weight decay or weight cost, or L2 weight cost. Um, and it looks like this, and it's obviously the logarithm of, the negative logarithm of a Gaussian prior on the weights. A standard Gaussian prior, so mean zero, covariance one, with some parameter in front. And there's a bit of an annoying business with the parameter because the loss tends to be unscaled. There is no number here in front. So we have to sort of think of the lambda as a ratio between prior and likelihood. OK. So um, what that means is that empirical risk minimization, and I've made this case a few times, but maybe it's good to do it properly once, is maximum a posteriori estimation. If you train a deep neural network, you're, find, you're trying to find the mode of a posterior distribution over the weights. And by the way, of course, there are other choices. So for example, sometimes people use dropout as the prior. So dropout, you can think of as sort of an L2, but with a diagonal matrix here in the middle, so you get some sort of theta transpose times, I don't know, S times theta, where S is some stochastic diagonal matrix of binary zeros and ones, where some bits get drop, dropped out every time. Or you can think of it as an approximation of some expected value or various other. There's lots and lots of theory trying to interpret what dropout actually is. Or people use sometimes L1 regularizers called the lasso to make sparse solutions. Uh, that's also a prior. It's just a log Laplace distribution. Uh, there are lots and lots of other choices that all amount in some sense to prior assumptions. Yes? Ah, so the question is, is there in base the so lambda trades off between prior and likelihood. In base theorem, this trade-off happens automatically. Why do we need to do this? I wouldn't say that it happens automatically in base theorem. Because if you think back, and we'll do that in a moment, to our uh, regression framework so far, we had an explicit number in front of the prior, and then an explicit number in front of the likelihood, a scale. So the likelihood had an error bar, right? So that was we interpreted it as an error bar. And the prior had a width, which we interpreted as some kind of model flexibility or model scale. Um, and here, lambda is just the ratio between the two. So why do we only need the ratio? Well, because we are just finding the mode. So um, if we wanted to have the shape of the posterior, we need to take care to actually assign an explicit value to either of them, because that will change the overall shape of the problem. And this is actually a good point that if you just do minimization, there are some things you don't have to worry about, like these overall scales. You just need to know ratios, signal-to-noise ratios rather than signal and noise. Um, and uh, that's sometimes going to bite us when we're trying to do uh, Bayesian inference in, in deep learning, because then these ratios will actually matter, and we'll somehow suddenly have to set them. OK. so. How do you do this in practice? Let me just show you my code as well so that everyone's on the same page. We define an, the terms for the loss. So this is the little l in the loss, the empirical risk, which is a function of two inputs. In this case, it's the weights and the biases of the network and a training batch, inputs and outputs. Um, and then 
you know, we get the batch, which contains inputs and outputs. We evaluate the deep network. So that's our f of theta and x. That gives us predictions, which are sort of y hat. And then we compute this binary cross entropy to compute predictions times, well, then you have to make sure that the labels are in the right scale, so they are between plus and minus one. And um, then uh, we need the regularizer term, which here is just going to be um, one half times the uh, L2 norm. And actually, for training, I've decided to just switch it off. And maybe this is annoying, so I've just, I'm, I'm actually mo like adding something that's zero. But that's maybe a good point to do, because people do actually do this in practice. There are quite a few people in deep learning who don't use weight regularizers at all. Uh, it also depends on the problem a lot. This problem is quite simple, so we don't have to worry so much about large weights. We can just set them, um, just remove the regularizer. That's maybe important, because again, Bayesian inference is not about the prior. It's not about having a prior at all. It's just that some spaces require a prior. In this case, we're going to be typically fine. Um, and then during training, as you may know, people often also compute an accuracy, which is not actually the loss. It's something else. It's just another number that they like to look at, which is how many labels the network correctly predicted. Now, one thing that I want to point out is if we think of this here as our log posterior, then this is our log likelihood. And previously, to make this plot, what I did is I produced this predict function. So up here, when I defined the network, I made this predict function, which takes in the inputs, x, maps them through the deep net, f. So now we have f of x and theta. And then it basically puts a sigmoid around it to make binary predictions, probabilities. And in fact, it doesn't return the sigmoid. It returns the log of the sigmoid. So you may notice, if you think about it a bit, that this function is actually pretty much the same thing as the empirical risk. It does the same thing. It's actually part of it. The only thing it doesn't do is multiply with the exact labels to get a risk. And this is sort of a totally minor code design thing, that it's sort of convenient to have these separate things, predict and risk. But it has led to some parts of the community thinking that there are these two different parts. There is training, and then there is inference. There's learning and inference. Learning is when you train the network, and then afterwards, when you give it an input, it's called inference. But it's really just predict, because the two call the same function. Why? Because learning is inference. That's what the probabilistic framework says. There are even workshops at New Rips, or at least there were a while ago, called inferring between inference and learning. What can we do between inference and learning? And it's, it, it, I don't think this is a helpful metaphor. So it's important to realize that the bit we do during training is not so different from the bit that we do during prediction. It's pretty much the same computation, including the output of the network. So the fact that there is a sigmoid added is not really part of the risk. It's just a likelihood. OK, so um, where am I with my code, actually? Uh, I probably don't. Like, I made this plot, so I can call this. And now um, what people then do is that they set up some ex sort of elaborate training scheme. So that scheme consists of building a function that loads the data from disk. That's called a data loader or a data stream. And in this case, because the data set is so trivial, it's very straightforward. We just take the data. we um, permute it randomly, which in this case we don't even have to do because the data is already randomly permuted. And then we just um, go through these random permutations, sample with uh, out replacement, and um, just return these training batches. So what this means is that when we then call an optimizer afterwards, we are going to, and we'll talk about this a bit more, replace this sum with a smaller sum, which is just a part of the data set. And that's nice if the data set is big, because then the computation is fast. But it also becomes stochastic. But you know, we'll have to deal with that. So then we create this stream. And for some people who do for the, the engineering setup, so people do large scale deep learning, this bit, those eight lines up there, are a big part of making things work. Because typically, the computation tends to be I.O. bound. So getting stuff from the disk is actually hard, harder than 
operating on it on a GPU. So you have to really think about how to do this efficiently. But here it's trivial for us. And then we use an optimizer. And these two lines hide this entire zoo of things that you could do. So you may know that by now there is like 200 different optimizers that random grad students have come up with for training deep neural networks. The two most popular ones are called Stochastic Gradient Descent, SGD. That's the original one from the 1950s. And Adam, which just happened to, by social dynamics, become the dominant optimization rule. It's not necessarily much better than anything else. It's just the one that everyone uses. And then there are 150 variants of that called NADAM, Adam, Madam, Sadam, and also RMS prop and uh, Heavy Ball and Nesterov and all these other ones. And you could spend an entire course on just listing all of these, but I'm not going to do that. And now this optimizer, like most of these optimizers are um, of a sort of Markovian type. So that means they iterate over an update step where we give them, they have some state. We give them a current training batch, and then they do something to um, using the loss, like they evaluate the loss and its gradient, and then do something with this gradient and value of the loss, actually mostly just the gradient, um, to update. In the case of gradient descent, that's a trivial update. You literally just add the gradient or minus the gradient times a constant called the learning rate. Um, and then we can let this run. And uh, in this case, this is going to run pretty fast because I am working on a tiny little data set. And you can see that the uh, test accuracy and train accuracy have gone up all the way to 1. So now we're done. And we can ask this network to make a prediction to call the log likelihood a few more times. This is, by the way, trivially fast in this case. Remember, last week we did this with Gaussian process classification, same data set. And there, this prediction took a, like a second or so to do, so, or maybe a few seconds. So this is a bit different. And we get this output. So this was training. We get the loss going down all the way nearly to 0. In this case, this is a loss that actually is strictly non-negative. So the best we could get is loss 0, in contrast to the log likelihood we had last week, which could go below 0. We can also plot accuracy on test and train set. That's what everyone always does. Because people, that's actually what people care about, weirdly. Uh -huh. So they go up, go to what you want, and now we have a prediction. And you can see that it sort of works. It's green where the data set is green. It's red where the data set is red. So fundamentally, as something you might want to do, it works. And you can immediately also see that there are lots and lots of problems with this thing. It also has this. So if you sort of mentally go back to lecture six or so when I did regression, when I came up with feature functions and we did linear regression and learned all these really like weird functions with nonlinearities and kinks, some of you were like, ah, oh, why should I use this set of features? Like, why is this not like why shouldn't there should be a better set of features? You see that the exact same thing is reproduced here as well. It's the same kind of pathology. We've made a hard choice of language to parameterize things in. In this case, these VLU nonlinearities. And we see them reflected in this classification output. Another problem that we'll need to talk about next week is see all this green down here and all this red up there? That's a lot of confidence. That's very high. So this, 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 the scale for this color map is 0 to 1 probability for the label. So what this network says is up there at 4 of minus 4, I am absolutely 100% certain that the correct label is red. And down here, I am absolutely 100% certain that the correct label is green, which maybe doesn't seem so nice, right? It's not necessarily something we might want to have. OK, so there's a question. Where in my code are the, are the gradients computed? So this happens uh, sort of along the way, tiny little bit uh, here. So value in grad is a, is a function in JAX that takes in a function called loss and computes its value and its gradient. And maybe this is a good point to sort of have after the first half of this lecture. This fact that I can write this tiny little line is probably the most important reason why deep learning is a thing these days. Because when I had this aforementioned con con uh, conversation with, uh, with um, UIT, these things didn't exist. Back then, we were writing our code in Java or in uh, MATLAB, maybe. I know, 
everyone has to snicker when I say MATLAB, but it used to be the thing. Everyone was writing code in, in, in MATLAB, even YYT. And you, had, you just wrote down the architecture. That was one piece of code called predict. And then you wrote a second function called gradient. And you just had to write the whole thing. There was no way to reuse something. I mean, maybe you could copy and paste some code. And then you let it run, and it didn't produce the right gradient. And then you had to check, and you had to go back and forth and find that there was a minus missing somewhere or a two that you had forgot in your derivation about the gradient. And that made progress very slow. So what has happened over the last decade or so, maybe more than a decade now, is that the software stack has developed a lot so that we can now do things like this. And this means that this level of abstraction has allowed people to build really complicated models. So things like transformers would have been an absolute nightmare to write in MATLAB from scratch. And maybe someone could have, could have actually done it, but then no one would have been able to copy it unless they had, to, they had released their code. And then it would have been very difficult to change something because the, there was no level of abstraction. But computer science sort of came to the rescue and pointed out that you can do certain things automatically and you can abstract away all sorts of structure. And that's why we have this explosion of complicated models now, um, like transformers and all the other ones as well. With that, I am uh, going to take a break. We will continue at 11.06. So um, there was a question during the break that I want to briefly address, which is I said, I, I pointed at this code and said uh, inference and learning are the same thing and it's therefore dangerous to use this word inference at test time rather than learning or the other way around. And maybe this, I made, did this too quickly and it was a bit too confusing. So the question is why is the word inference wrong for this function? So, in the deep learning world, there is a typical nomenclature that says there is, there is learning and inference. Learning is the bit you do with your training set, where you change the weights. And then inference is afterwards, you've stored your set of weights, and someone gives you a new input, and then you make a prediction. And that's called inference. So what I'm saying is, using the word inference for this, for this second process, this latter process, is maybe an unfortunate choice of words. Why? Because we use the word Bayesian inference for figuring out things we don't know, latent quantities. And training the deep neural network is an instance of inference. So in that sense, this learning is inference. Why? Because I just showed you a slide showing that what this process does is finding the mode of a posterior distribution. That's part of Bayesian inference. Because we could then afterwards do something else to construct an approximate full posterior. So another way of thinking about, so really my point is, this process of picking in an input after training and making a prediction should just not be called inference. We should just not use the word inference. Another way of thinking about why this is a problem is this code here, this line 12 to 22, is really just a partial evaluation of this function. I could implement predict by taking this empirical risk and wrapping a func tools partial around it such that it only takes, it only produces this but not this and then evaluates this function and then leaves open this bit as a new input. That's what predict is. It's the exact same function. So if you think of it as a software engineer, you might say, it's really it's bad software design practice to have this function and then have this thing on top. Whoops, where is it? Here, which is the same function, just partially evaluated. It's dangerous, right? If I made a change to this line because somehow I decided I want to use a different prediction function, I won't, I won't, it won't automatically change the empirical risk. That's not good, no? We should make things you know, so, that, so that one change somewhere gets propagated somewhere else. So that's mostly sort of my gripe, right? It's this, it helps conceptually to realize that what we do is evaluate a probability distribution. And so in, in Bayesian machine learning, we think of evaluating a probability distribution as the elementary thing we do all the time. And inference is the application of Bayes' theorem, where you get some kind of inverse probability. And that's what learning actually is. You had a question? Is this sorted now?
So you're, so you're matching, again, sort of the exact same problem that also exists in frequentist statistics, that there is seemingly a separation between um, estimating an unknown quantity and predicting an unknown quantity. But they are always just evaluating probability distributions. Sometimes they are forward probability distributions and sometimes backwards. So sometimes you apply Bayes' theorem and sometimes you just have the thing already. But they're just probability distributions, so they're the same thing. And that's maybe why we have a probabilistic machine learning class to point out these structural similarities so that you, know, you can sort of save some, some RAM in your brain. You only have to learn one of these concepts. So now what I want to do for the remainder of, this, of today's lecture is to make very explicitly the connection to the stuff we've done so far. And you probably already have realized it by now, but maybe it's good to just really carefully do this once and for all. So in our course so far, here in this room, we started with regression, which is, so regression, by the way, being, or supervised learning, being the same problem that m much of deep learning addresses, by these linear models. So I've already spoken about these before. We decide that our function f, which seems to have the same structure as the deep learning f, has this particular form. We choose some features and then multiply with some weights. And I already mentioned when we did this, so in passing, but it obviously confused a few people, that this is like constructing a single layer neural network. It's like taking the inputs, applying some features, some representation of the data, and then multiplying with some weights to get a prediction. So this is a special case of the function I showed you called network, where there is no hierarchy. It's just Take the input, apply the nonlinearity, multiply by the weights. It's literally the, sorry, I'm going to scroll around in code again. Um, it's this function, but we comment out this bit. We just don't do multiple layers. We just take the last layer, multiply the weights, add the biases, done. That's it. That's the same thing. So of course, you could think of this also as saying, if someone gives me a neural network, I just can just call that phi, and then W1 are just the last layer of the network. That's it. That's the same thing. Yes? So previously, you said that with deep learning, we had, again, the same problem that we don't know which features and stuff like that uh, as in here. But since they, they claim that deep learning makes it likely that the feature features are kind of inferred from the index, so. so this is exactly, now your question is about this sort of ongoing, or by now it's probably settled, but, but this debate that raged in the machine learning community for quite a while, is it actually a cool thing to learn phi, to learn the features, or as the community says, learn the representations. So there's a conference called ICLR, I International Conference of Learning Representations, that was created in the early 2011s, 2012, something or so was the first time ICLR, ICLR happened, um, which was created because the people who wanted to do this, learning phi, felt that they weren't allowed to publish their papers at New Rips, the main conference of the back then machine learning. And by now we just, so this is one of these, uh, you know, famous XKCD memes situation afterwards. Now we just have three conferences. Previously we had two, now we have three. iClear and ICML and New Rips. Because everyone does this now and learns representations. But of course you could have a question is whether this is actually more powerful than to do Gaussian process regression. And we'll talk about that in 10 minutes. So let's get there. Maybe just to point out again, what, because we use phi, we get to pick what the, we can sort of get to pick a feature for arbitrary inputs. We never need to actually deal with x. Phi takes care of x. And that's why we can apply this framework to a very, very broad class of inputs x. We can define features, of course, on real vectors. But we could also define features on strings, like for language, and including programming languages. We can define features on graphs to do material science and biomedical science and learn properties of molecules and genes and proteins and so on. We could even write features for functions. So the input x could itself be a function. Then what we are learning is an operator, something that operates on a function. This is a topic that is currently quite hot in machine learning, in particular in machine learning for the physical sciences, because it allows constructing simulation methods. You give me a differential equation, I tell you the solution of the differential equation. 
That's a map from a function to a function, an operator. And you can go even crazier and apply this feature notion to pretty much arbitrary concepts you can think of, including Gödel numbers for the Turing machine, so programs for the universal Turing machine, and then you know, have learn properties of Turing machines, if you like. Of course, you can't learn everything, because certain things are not computable, but you can still set up the framework. So how did we train this class of regression algorithms? We decided to do Bayesian inference. So the language we used was to say, ah, let's make the prior assumption that the weights are Gaussian distributed and that the likelihood is Gaussian through this linear function, which is a linear map of theta. Why? Because I said that Gaussians are closed under all linear maps. So Gaussian inference under this linear connection is a closed form linear algebra. And then we apply Bayes' theorem, prior times likelihood divided by the evidence, observe that this particular choice of prior and likelihood gives a nice posterior, a Gaussian posterior, with closed form expressions for the posterior mean and the posterior covariance, which happen to look like this. Um, I had them on a few slides now already. And we realized that um, we can compute those, those with linear algebra and do all sorts of cool, interesting things. So, this is the classic story for the Bayesian inference perspective on these classes of algorithms. And as we now know from the previous few slides, and because I've pointed it out multiple times over the course, there is an equivalent formulation in terms of empirical risk minimization. So we can think of the same problem as with prior and likelihood as finding the mode of a Gaussian posterior, which is equal to the mean. Why is this a Gaussian posterior? Because it's the, in the logarithm, the sum of a square regularizer and a square loss. So the sum of two squares is another square. Right? The sum of two quadratic polynomials is a quadratic polynomial. And therefore, the posterior is the exponential of a square. And the mode of this posterior, the mean of this Gaussian distribution, is the, we, can, we could find by minimizing the negative logarithm of this posterior, which happens to be the sum of two squares, and we can rearrange and find this expression that I had on the previous slide, literally by minimizing this function. So, Gaussian parametric regression, least squares regression, is single layer shallow learning. It's like learning a shallow neural network with a square loss and a square regularizer. It's a special case. It's a special case that, and, oh, and by the way, the curvature of this um, empirical risk function, the negative log posterior, is equal to the inverse of the posterior covariance. And I'm tempted to say at the mode, but it's just true without that addition, because, because it's a quadratic function, and quadratic functions have a constant Hessian everywhere. So we don't even need to talk about where we evaluate the Hessian. So this is maybe good, because, uh, well, maybe it's bad, actually. Maybe it's bad, let's talk about that first, because it's a special case of deep learning. It seems like deep learning is a more powerful thing than that. And it is, that's true. But it's also good because we realize that we can compute these two quantities, posterior mean and covariance, in closed form. Ah, so linear algebra, very powerful, no free parameters, no learning rate, no Adam, SGD, anything. It's just Cholesky, done. And then what we did when we did Gaussian process regression, effectively, was to look at this network and sort of say, well, what if we add more and more and more and more and more weights until we somehow can do the linear algebra in closed form without ever looking at the weights. So um, we then ended up with this framework that was motivated in a sort of from the Bayesian perspective. There is this functional object called Gaussian process, which if you multiply it with a likelihood by Bayes' theorem, gives us a Gaussian process posterior, which has this property that it contains these two functions, the posterior mean function and posterior covariance function. And we, we actually then realized there was, this there was this lecture on the theory of Gaussian processes and kernels, where you all kind of went, whatever, uh, which, which, where I tried to point out that this is sort of effectively 
like training an infinitely wide neural network. But because it's functional analysis, it's not quite so simple. We don't just get, we don't just get to say, ah, we just make infinitely wide networks, and then everything just works. There are a few subtleties that arise. And for example, one of them is that it's not so straightforward to just write down what the risk even is. Because now we have this infinite dimensional object called function in here. And if we want to write an equation like this, then we first need to define what that actually is, this regularizer. And we have to do that now. There's no way around having a regularizer now, because there are infinitely many of these f's. We can't just say we pick whichever f, because there are infinitely many possible choices of functions which all drive this to 0. And that would be boring. So we have to introduce some, well, it would be boring also because it would not allow generalization, right? It would not tell us at all how to make a prediction at some other point. So to mediate between training points and test points, we need to write down what this object is, this L2 regularizer in function space. And it turns out that what it is is this so-called uh, rich risk or rich regularizer or um, maybe more tan like tangibly the norm of the function we're trying to find in this weird mathematical space called the reproducing kernel Hilbert space associated with the kernel. And there's lots of complicated theory around that, which also gives an intuition for what this posterior covariance now is. It's, it's sort of like a log Hessian, but it's not actually a Hessian because this function is a bit too complicated for this. What it is is, in some sense, as I pointed out in that lecture, some worst case estimate for the deviation of the function from uh, the true function from the estimated function, assuming that the true function is in this weird space, the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And we also saw in passing that there's this theorem that says uh, you can write any such function as a sum over countably many such feature functions. And how exactly they arrive is a bit ticky and complicated, and I spoke about this at length during that lecture. But the main point about this insight is that, yes, indeed, we can think of Gaussian process regression as infinitely wide neural networks, countably infinitely wide, where the individual units are those things called eigenfunctions of the kernel. And then in the last two lectures, I said, OK, and now what about classification? So if we need to, do, if we need to predict labels that um, are not real numbers, then we just take this uh, likelihood, which looks like this, this logistic function. And by the way, there are other likelihoods, but this is the one that I like to use, or that everyone else also likes to use. And if you're wondering why, well, check out this week's homework. It might give you an idea for why this might be an interesting thing to do. Um, and uh, then we, now mostly we just, point, we just realize that using this likelihood is exactly equivalent to using this binary cross entropy term, this logistic loss that I've used in the code that I just showed you in the first half of this lecture. So it's really the same thing, right? Now we're very, very closely connected. Quadratic regularizer cross entropy loss is exactly what we've been doing. And now I briefly need to point out that, of course, most classification problems are not binary. They're not just one label versus the other, but they are multiple labels. You know, computer vision, your standard task is this, you know, car. Is, is this image a car, a human, a baby, a banana, whatever? That's a multi-class classification problem. And here I just need to point out that for your sake, I've decided to only do binary classification. And I'll use five minutes to tell you why. Because, of course, we could do everything we've done so far in a probabilistic version also on multi-class classification problems. So how would that work? Well, the idea is that for the last layer of our neural network, the output of our network is not going to be a single scalar, but it's going to be k numbers, where k is the number of classes that we're trying to predict. And then we take a softmax over those classes. So for that, we have to turn this vector of weights into a matrix, a rectangular matrix that maps from this last layer to the top one. And in our code for the definition of the network, um, 
Of course, this is relatively easy. It involves putting something other than a one in this bit of the code. And then we just have to make sure that the data also has the right shape. So I left some comments in there where we do this. So uh, when I make a data set here, I've left in some code for, you can of course take data and make it of this shape. And then what we need to do is we need to somehow come up with a probabilistic formulation of what it means to learn multiple output functions. And this goes in the Bayesian machine learning world under the notion of multi-output Gaussian processes. And the formalism for this is that you effectively write a covariance function, a kernel, that defines the covariance between the seeth output of the function at location A and the teeth output of the function at location B. So that's now a, a function that takes in four inputs rather than two. But of course, you can you know, imagine a reshape where the you, tuples of two become just one input. Right? So on the left-hand side, you have input AC, and on the right-hand side, you have input BD. And then everything just becomes a complete array-centric programming nightmare. Right? There's just lots and lots of inputs, and we need to like, reshape in the right way around and out. And, um, the piece of Python code that I used for Gaussian process inference so far actually allows for this to work, but it's not exactly nice because it's even more dimensions that go into the input of the kernel. It's a bit painful. You saw Marvin do a variant of that in his tutorial, if you were there. Um, and there are lots of interesting structures about this. So for example, one thing people tend to do is that they assume that the covariance between the inputs and the outputs factorizes. So there's one kernel for between the inputs and one kernel for between the outputs. This is like assuming that there are weights genera generated for the input layer and the output layer separate from each other. Or if you think of a single layer neural network, that means you learn the rows and the columns. There's a generative process for the rows and the columns of that output weight matrix, and you just take the outer product of them. Um, and that has all sorts of interesting algebraic results. You, can, you get nice structure in the covariance matrix called Kronecker structure, which speeds up the computation. You can do it faster and so on and so on. And there are lots of cool little tricks. But if I would have done that in the course, it would just have confused you like crazy. So what I want you to take away is that multi-class classification is not a problem from the probabilistic perspective. It's not like we couldn't do it. But it's just even more tedious than what we've, what, what we've done so far. So we'll leave it as an exercise to the reader. So if you really want to do multi-class classification with GPs, you can look at this slide again and stare at it for a bit and think about what that means. And then you can actually do it. And I actually thought of giving this as a homework exercise this week, but I decided against it. So, yeah. so I just want to make sure you don't think that it's like, you know, this, this is impossible. It's just really. So if we made some hard choices on how to, how to design the code that you use for your homework so far, and now adding that later would be a bit painful. So that's also why I'll keep showing you binary classification and why we will keep asking you in the homework to work on binary MNIST. I know it feels a bit sort of toyish to take MNIST and then reduce this to binary MNIST, but it's really just because otherwise you would have to write even more code, and we just want to keep it simple for you. OK. So now is this question. Here comes this question. Is it, what, what is now actually better? So we spent four lectures talking about Gaussian processes. And we just realized Gaussian processes are infinitely wide neural networks. And now I just showed you deep learning. And of course, you've had deep learning classes before, all of you. So you know that there is this choice of deep as well. So we can do. We can do deep learning, and we can do infinitely wide learning. Non-parametric is a nice word for it. Which of them is better? Why do we, why do, we do one over the other? And someone asked uh, last week, actually, this is a problem for me in practice. If you give me a data set, it seems like every course I go to tries to advocate for some other type of learning. There's deep learning, there's non-parametric learning, there's parametric learning, probabilistic learning, statistical learning. Which one do I actually pick? Well, so part of the story is that we just found out that they are all really closely connected to each other. And actually, what I want you to get away with at the end of this course is to know how to sort of 
map between the different concepts and just write and combine them whichever way you like. But if, for the sake of argument, we really stick to one of them now for a moment, then we can talk about the weaknesses and strengths of each of these frameworks and think about why they might be better or worse in some settings. So the classic argument for kernel machines is the following. These are these infinitely wide networks. So at the point in time, this was around, you know, early 2000s when kernel learning was all the rage. And this was like the uh, like three quarters of new RIPs was just kernel papers and GP papers. Uh, people were trying to make arguments to the uh, connectionists why this is the right thing to do. And one of them goes like this. I spoke about these reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, right? So the RKHSs, these spaces are, and by the way, Matthias Hein now does this as well in his class, right? Has he gotten to the point where he does RKHS? Yes, okay, so some nodding. Maybe you're not sure that he's doing it or not, but yeah, okay? So these are these spaces that span the hypotheses that we can reach with kernel rich regression or Gaussian process regression as posterior mean estimates. So any posterior mean estimate that comes from a Gaussian process regressor or from a kernel rich estimator will always lie in this reproducible kernel, kernel Hilbert space. And so one question you could ask is, how powerful are these spaces? Can they approximate everything? And indeed, they can. So there are theorems that say that there are certain types of kernels, like, for example, this one, which is infamous because people use it so much, the square exponential kernel, or Gaussian kernel, or radial basis function kernel. Um, there are entire entire workshops on radial basis functions in Oberwolfach, for example, just on this one thing. Um, this kernel happens to have the property that its reproducing kernel Hilbert space lies dense in the space of all continuous functions. So like the rational numbers lie dense in the real numbers, this function space lies dense within the space of all continuous functions. So for any continuous function, and pretty much any interesting function is sort of continuous, right? At least, at least piecewise, right? So for any continuous function, you can find an element in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space of this kernel arbitrarily close to it, where arbitrarily close is in some sense of some norm that has to be defined correctly. And that led to an argument that these were then called characteristic kernels or universal kernels that said, this should be enough for everyone, to quote Bill Gates. Right? We don't need anything else. We don't need deep learning at all because these are universal function approximators. They can learn any function. And maybe you've heard sentences like this before. But the problem with this is that it's a non-constructive statement. It just says there is a function. If you give me your function, there, I know that there is a function in the space that I can approximate that is arbitrarily close. So. Here's the space of all continuous functions. Your function lies in here. And the RKHS lies sort of dense in this space. There's everywhere dotted around this space, there are functions from this RKHS. So there's also one that is arbitrarily close. What this doesn't tell you is, if I start here and then take data, how long it will take to get here. So here's a picture that I constructed a long time ago as an example. What I show you here is, in black, in the background, one particular function that is continuous. In fact, it's even more than continuous. It's infinitely often differentiable. It's a very smooth function. So it definitely lies within this space. And then in red, I show you the Gaussian process posterior, which comes from this RBF kernel. So the posterior mean function, the red solid thing, that is an element of the RKHS. The other stuff around it is not. That's why I'm not plotting it. But the red stuff is. Uh, an element of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And now we can condition. So here's the first data point. Uh -huh. First data point. Second data point, uh, third, fourth, fifth. And you can see that everything works. We're learning very well, right? It's sort of, we get closer and closer to the true function. So now we have 10 evaluations, and the function is beginning to approximate the black thing, especially where we have more data, we get ever closer. And now we go from 10 evaluations to 20 evaluations, and ah, this is what happens. And if we go to 50 evaluations, it looks like this. Totally crazy deviations. This also goes down here to like 10 to the minus 20 or so. I've just cut it off. 
But the theorem says that eventually we'll get there because we're just constraining the function space. And there has to be a function, a red function, arbitrarily close to the black one. So let's keep going. Let's keep going. It has to work. And in fact, it kind of does work, actually. So everywhere that where there's a black dot, we get ever closer. But we pay a price in that there's these nasty, nasty uh, deviations around it. And in fact, if you plot the RMSE, the, so the average square error between the estimated function and the true function, it looks like this. So here are up to a few thousand evaluations. The red line is the, this sort of uh, convergence towards the truth. And what I'm plotting in uh, orange is the, so this is a log-log plot, right? So orange plot, that the straight lines. Does anyone know, remember what a straight line is in a log-log plot from your data literacy class? It's a power law. So in this case, this power law is x, so number of function evaluations, raised to the minus 1 half square root convergence. Square root is like the worst possible way you could ever worry about. So that's the convergence value of a Monte Carlo estimator. It doesn't get much, better, much, much worse than that. You would like to have high polynomial conversions rate, right? 2, 3, 4, 5, something like this. Maybe even exponential, but you don't get that. What you get is something that's slower than um, uh, polynomial. And you can f see that this, is, this curve kind of asymptotically gets flatter and flatter. And that's actually true. There's a theorem that says for such functions like the one I just constructed carefully, the conversion rate is logarithmic in the number of evaluations. And since you're a computer scientist, you know that logarithms are bad, right? It's not, not useful. So what the problem here is, is that the, the language that we're describing the function in that we're trying to learn is universal. It can describe everything. But we haven't thought about how long it will take to describe it, what the length of the string is that we need to write to approximate it. So you can have universal languages, but they might still make it very hard to describe certain things. And results like this sort of raise the question what these functions are actually good for. And then what happened was that a little bit later, you know, um, people started writing these very complicated theorems that show, so this is from uh, Art van der Vaart and uh, Jan van Santen from 2011, who uh, what was what, just one example of these learning rate theoretic results for Gaussian processes and kernel machines. Uh, back then, there were a lot of papers like this that you can read or not read. And what this thing says is that if you match the reproducing kernel Hilbert space well to the function you're trying to learn, then you actually can get very good rates. But if there is not a good match, your convergence rate can be very, very, very bad. You're not going to learn anything. Right? Logarithmic rates are just useless. It's, you might as well not learn. Um, but it also says that you know, if you carefully look at this expression and get things right, then the convergence rates can actually be very good. So if you're trying to learn a function that happens to be three times uh, continuously differentiable and you use the exact right kernel, then your conversion rate can indeed be polynomial of decent order, actually, for a, for a function of this type. And so what this boils down to is that if you know enough about the problem, then you can build very good kernel methods. And now the question is kind of what are these problems where these models actually work really well. So here's a, sort of a short so what, and I'll have more in a moment. Um, one way in which such models are actually really good, so these pure kernel methods that do not learn uh, uh, representations, is for problem classes where you know a lot about the problem very precisely, and you need to carefully build an algorithm that works really well. My favorite go-to example for such problems is simulation. If your task is to solve a differential equation, Schrodinger's equation, Navier-Stokes equations, if you want to predict the weather, if you want to uh, infer the properties of some material, then you need to solve a differential equation, and you need to be able to say 
you, like you have written down the differential equation, so you know exactly what's in there. You know that this, it says something like the second derivative of this function with respect to this variable plus the first derivative with respect to that variable times the second derivative and so on and so on. Then you know that the function you're looking for has exactly this many derivatives because otherwise you're not going to be able, there's no meaningful solution to the differential equation. But it also, you also cannot assume that there are additional derivatives because otherwise you're overly constraining the solution space and you might miss some interesting parts of the problem by imposing regularity. Now doing this right is very difficult with deep neural networks because with this choice, with this language that we have available, relus and sigmoids, it's really tricky to write a hypothesis class that con it exactly constructs the right types of functions. Think about it, like how would you build a neural network that can represent through its weights functions that are exactly three times differentiable? You will need a link function that is exactly three times differentiable. I mean, you, you can build those. It's not like they're impossible to build, but then you'll have finitely many of them flying around, right? Not arbitrarily many. So you have to be really careful about how many of the, them you have and so on. So your normal link functions are either ReLU, that's only, well, in a way that's non-differentiable, or maybe it's you know, piecewise linear as a model class, or you use something like TANH or ZLU, which are smooth. So they're infinitely often differentiable. And in fact, this is a real problem in practice, right? And simulation methods don't work really well on such problems. So for such settings, Gaussian process models are really powerful because you can carefully choose a kernel that has exactly the right power. It, has, it, it puts no further assumptions on the problem other than the ones that you absolutely have to have. But then there are other applications like computer vision and natural language processing, which are the two most common prominent applications of deep learning at the moment where we know very little about the problem. In fact, so little that we have a hard time even writing down what the function class is that we're looking for. And those are exactly the settings where deep learning has excelled so far. It's the ones where people have spent decades trying to write good features. What is a good feature set for natural images? You know, there used to be arguments about Gabor filters and these kind of things. And now maybe what the world has realized is that it's maybe just good to do a parameterization in terms of lots of parameters in a deep fashion so that you can learn a representation and then you can learn good statistics of the natural world. One quick question because I want to finish in five minutes. No, so my prediction is not that if we learn more about computer vision, we're going to use Gaussian processes for computer vision. My prediction is that for applications that have a lot of structure, shallow models are more interesting because you can design them by hand. And these are not necessarily boring applications, right? So the simulation of physical systems is not boring. Simulating the, the climate or the cosmos is not a boring problem. And for those problems, kernel machines are really interesting. They're not the only solution, but they're very interesting. And any deep solution will have to inherit some of their structure. And for problems that have inherently little structure, like images of the natural world or human natural language, we don't even have to look for kernel solutions, even though people tried for quite some time. And maybe at this point in 2023, we can stop looking for them unless those kernels happen to be constructed from a deep neural network, and we'll talk about how to do that in the next lecture. But I don't want to end here. I want to show you two more slides that summarize kind of my view from a more algorithmic perspective. So let's look at deep learning and Gaussian processes and think about what people actually like and dislike about them. And we will find that the uh, sort of complementary things that kind of interact with each other a bit. And it's not just that one works and the other one doesn't. It's much more subtle than that. So, Deep learning. Here is deep learning again, uh, some math and some stuff to talk about. I think what people really like about deep learning is that you can think of training as O of one. And I always have to raise my hands around like this because we already talked about this. The way that O of one emerges in training deep neural networks is that you observe that you can construct gradients on a subset of the data called a batch. That's a stochastic gradient. 
And then you can train the model using those stochastic gradients, which means that at no time do you have to wait for a full pass through the data set. In particular, you can train these models on an infinite data set, and you don't have to worry about the size of the data set. No. However, we already observed when we did parametric regression from the Gaussian perspective that that property itself is not unique to deep learning. You just have to be a bit more careful how to do it when you do non-parametric and in particular just parametric Gaussian regression. It's absolutely possible to train a par parametric Gaussian regression algorithm with stochastic gradient descent. There's no, no need to think of this as a uniquely deep learning thing. The other thing people really like is this what I will call array structure. So this is something that is actually a big topic in the sort of uh, uh, theory of software engineering for deep learning. I don't know that's the, that, whether that community even exists. It's maybe just 20 people. But um, so what I mean by this is if you look at this object here, this gradient of the function of the loss with respect to the deep net over the data, then you can think of an array like this. So this contains a sum over the training data, and then it contains all of the weights of the network, or all of the weights and biases. So you can think of computing a gradient that expands this object, which is an array in weight space and in data space. So there's some kind of array hiding somewhere in an abstract space that would give you the gradient on your whole data set. And now what we do when we compute the, the batch gradient is we com compute some of the columns of this matrix, the individual batch gradients, and then we sum over them. So that's a kind of map reduction over it. And that's a structure that is very rich as a language to think about. And you've actually encountered it already in the JAX code that I showed you, right? There are all these sometimes tedious um, slicing operations into arrays that pretty much do this kind of process. So what people like about this is that arrays are very structured objects. For example, mapping operations on arrays allow all sorts of efficient um, speed ups, right? Because you get structure that is more powerful than a for loop to work with for the compiler. For example, you can do what's called sharding. So you can farm out certain parts of the computation to different machines across a data center and then collect them again. Or you can also do batching. So you can decide which of the columns. You can think more mathematically about which of these columns do I actually want to load, to compute. And you can think about the reduction uh, computation. So one of the things that my group, for example, has worked on is do we always need to just compute the sum over this? But can we maybe compute weighted sums? Or can we maybe you, you can compute nonlinear transformations applied element-wise and then summed over to construct interesting estimators? All of this is possible when you think of this computation from an array-centric perspective. Now, for Gaussian process models, you can do the same thing, but it's a bit more hidden. You have to really know what you're doing. And that's why I think in deep learning, this has been more sort of powerful. Another two things that are not so entirely serious that people like about neural networks is that, well, it's just, you know, neural networks sounds really cool, something to do with the brain, somehow big. And it sounds a bit silly, but that's really how they were sold to the community. So uh, Jeff Hinton has been on for 20 years about how the brain works. And he keeps telling these, he used to keep telling them, well, now it's a bit different, but he used to tell these stories about how he's trying to figure out how the brain works. And people just like that. It just gets people excited, in particular PhD students, which is what matters. Um, the, the other thing that's kind of nice, that's sort of an afterthought actually is, once you've trained the data, you can throw away, uh, sorry, once you've trained the model, you can throw away the data. And this used to be not so important maybe, but I mean the last half year has shown how important this is. Because none of us knows how GPT works. Why? Because we don't have access to the data or the weights. So if you, if you train a deep neural network, you can afterwards forget about the data, so you can you know, not worry about it anymore, and then you can keep the weights behind locked doors, behind an API, and never show it to the world. And that's really convenient. So um, for Gaussian processes, there's this annoying thing that the data sort of are the model, right? because it's non-parametric, so every datum is actually explicitly in the model. So you, if you release the, the model, you release the data, pretty much. So what people don't like about deep learning 
is that training it is really fiddly. And I will keep going on about this in later lectures. Um, and you've already seen some examples of it. You have to make so many choices to make it work. And quite often, some of these choices are extremely sensitive. If you get it slightly wrong, it doesn't work. Or it, or it works, but you don't know why. Or you change something, it starts working better than it did before, and you don't understand why. This is really bad compared to the setting in least squares regression, where it's just linear algebra, and everyone, well, not everyone, but there are people who really understand how linear algebra works. So they can write little black box algorithms that just work. Uh, another thing that we'll get to in a later lecture that is not so great um, in deep learning is that when you've trained the model and you've just thrown away your data set, if there's now a new data coming in, it's at least at first sight not so straightforward what to do with that. And it's a common setting in applications that you have a trained model that you've now deployed to the world. It's internet facing and people are using it and you're collecting new data as it comes. And now there's a shift in the data set. You've trained uh, you know, your, uh, your, your Spotify, you've trained a recommender algorithm for your users on you know, music, the greatest music of the 70s, 80s and 90s and today. And now it's 2023 and people just want to listen to completely different music. So your model is trained on something that it doesn't represent anymore what's happening now. Of course, that's a different time scale, but yeah. So you can collect new data. You have access to the data set, to, to the stream of users. But what do you do with it? Do you always just you know, go back to the old data? You mush it together. You let some SGD run somehow and hope that it works. That's a dangerous thing to do. And I already pointed out some weird, weird properties of these models, that they have this very high confidence in weird regions where they really shouldn't be so confident. And that seems dangerous because it allows adversarial attacks. So what people like about Gaussian processes is that they are complementing this view. They are very structured models that you can train with linear algebra. If you have more data, we know exactly what to do. You did it as a homework. And there is beautiful deep theory for them. So what they don't like is that training is expensive. And so we'll need to fix that. So in the next lecture, I'm going to take the insights that we had today, which is that the connection between deep learning and all the stuff we've done so far is actually quite close in the sense that we can think of the models that we've trained as shallow, potentially infinitely wide neural networks trained with a square loss, or in the case of classification, actually trained with the loss that people use in deep learning already, and a quadratic regularizer. And then think about what that actually allows us, like whether this allows us to connect these two models very closely to each other, these two model classes, so that these fields that have historically evolved completely separate from each other, Bayesian learning, deep learning, and kernel learning, or statistical learning theory, can be sort of combined again, at least in your heads, into one conceptual framework that you can use for everything. And with that, I'm done for today. Thank you very much for your time. Please leave feedback. <laughs>